G'day everyone, welcome to Turning Tuesday. This week I'm making a Claret Ash Bowl. As with every week, I include mistakes, errors, and brain malfunctions. The end result was a bit smaller than originally planned, and no, that's not what she said. Before I get into turning this week, I want to give a shout out to a couple of Aussie YouTubers. They are fellow woodworkers. Sid does a lot of turning. Alan does other larger scale woodworking projects. And they're both fantastic channels. If you're enjoying my stuff, you'll probably enjoy theirs. So check it out. And now let's get into the turning. You may notice that I am starting square. I'd be able to get a bit bigger bowls if I actually had made a circle jig for the bandsaw. You'll notice here that the piece comes to a complete stop. That's not the belt slipping, it's not from a catch, it's purely that the teeth of the four spur drive have not sunk into the claret ash. Claret ash is really soft, it's quite nice, and it's fantastic to work, but the teeth had not sunk in and therefore it was spinning. So how I fix this is pushing the tailstock a bit tighter, which locks it in a bit more firm on the spur, which is effectively just locking it all down. So I've just used the long wings of the long bowl gouge, and now I'm gonna turn it around, do some push cups up the side, and try and get it up to round. Now I know there's already a loose section on the top, and as you may notice, there's a new addition to my floor. I took a nice chunk out there from the piece that was on top. Going back to using the long winds and pulling in that top. You may notice that I'm still riding my tool a little bit higher than centre. There's a reason for that, and that's called laziness. I should have dropped a little bit more, it would have cut a bit better. Um, but as it's going, it was already cutting fine because it is such a soft and forgiving wood. If this was something like the piece from last week where it was kiln dried wood, this would be absolutely painful. So looking on the left hand side, you can still see a little bit of ghosting on the piece I've just turned away. That's still quite a bit of bark there. I am slowly getting it down so that I can actually put a foot on it. Mostly round now, so I am going to try and make some extremely long stringers and clean up what I can. Doing a little face push cut across there and I decide maybe I'll start forming that foot. As you can see, getting some of those really nice stringers going now. I don't know if there's anything more satisfying than seeing those long stringers come off. Right now, my main focus is that noise. I really do not enjoy this noise. As I get to the top there, there's a large piece of where this was fused to another piece of trunk. And it's already broken off once, and I've already decided I'm gonna take it down below that. But in the meantime, I am going to try and fix it a little bit. Now, you may notice here that I am putting a foot on it. I'm putting a very, very little foot on it. How do you think that ends up? I'll give you a clue. It sat on the shelf for about three weeks after what happened with it. So right there, I'm actually trying to give the bowl a proper foot not just the tenon. And I have now flipped it around on that tiny little tenon. It's a bitsy tiny tenon. 
And as you can hear, I really don't like the sound of that noise. I'm really expecting it to just chunk off at any stage now. And I got lucky it didn't break off for any further than what it did originally. But as you can tell, there's some wild grain through this already. We haven't even got to the bowl portion yet. And right now I'm just having a good look at this and I've decided I'm going to try and at least glue the bases of it up and get some control back and hopefully get rid of it smoothly. The only reason I'm putting the glue is to try and solidify it. It's not to add an accent piece. Now we flipped it around and I'm having a look at this. So my main plan here while flipping it around was take it down and get rid of all that loose excess stuff. And as you can hear that noise is horrible. I'm cringing as it's turning because it, I really do not like it and I'm expecting something to come flying off. A single catch and I'm done. So far so good, it is going down quite nicely, and so I decide uh, I might as well start taking it down a little bit more, maybe pour it a little bit. Just remember what's behind this piece of wood is that itsy bitsy tiny tenon. So moving in here, I turn the tool around and start pulling back towards me and my brain did not catch up that it started to wobble. So I went for a second hit after it was already wobbling and yes it is broken. So, three weeks later, I drill a center hole, I mount it on a woodworm screw, and I start again. This time we're starting from mostly round already. I am cranking it down. So with my little chuck, if the woodworm loosens itself at all, it's completely loose. So you gotta crank it on, then crank it down, and then hand tighten it again. Step one for this was try and smooth out the foot from where that broken tenon was. As you can see, I'm putting a little too much pressure than I should, which means I'm probably due a tool sharpen. So I'm considering a tool sharpen right now, and at the same time, I'm also like, this isn't cutting very well. So I decide to do a belt swap from low speed, high torque to medium, medium. And so that will give me a nice range up to 1800 RPM. I started here somewhere around 750, 800-ish. And as you can tell, it's already starting to cut a bit better. And let's turn on warp speed. So we've just cranked it straight up to 1800 and as you can tell straight away it is cutting beautifully. You'll notice that little jump there. What that was was heat from both the tool and from the shavings. They were coming off extremely hot. Again another sign that I need to sharpen. And this is cutting really slowly. Again, another sign that I need to sharpen. Do you think I'm actually paying attention to my tool or do you think I'm making a silly mistake here? I'm fairly confident it's a silly mistake. I've just gone for a little quick sharpen there. And as you can tell, it's starting to cut a little bit better. 
I don't think I did a perfect job with the sharpen on that one. And I think I'm going to go and revisit. And make sure you tighten your tool rest. Tighten, tighten, tighten. That noise is another sign that I need to sharpen my tool. Tell you what, the shape is actually starting to take form. I decided I wanted a little bit more of a cove at the base, so I'll just take a little bit of waste away and then shape it back down. Having a quick look at the current state. And decide I'm going to put a foot on it. So what I've decided is on my chuck, I'm going to use my larger shark jaws instead of the dovetail jaws. Because the dovetail jaws are only like five centimeters, whereas the shark jaws go a bit further out now i've just said i'm going to use shark jaws what am i doing i'm the wrong way now while my shark jaws can do recess or do tenon I was planning on using a tenon, so I now have to clean up what I've just done and move into creating a new tenon for the shark jaws. So what I'm just going to do is flatten the bottom and remark it out. And then reshape. I'm glad I caught that mistake then instead of as I was turning it around. So here I am just giving it a quick remark and I'm pretty sure this is the third time I've had to mark a tenon on this. Now I'm only pushing in with the side that's closest to me and that's because the piece is turning towards me. If I touch with the back edge it will flip it over, A hit my knuckle and potentially create a pretzel. And moving into some of those really satisfying shavings. It's amazing what a uh, sharp tool can do. You may hear I go into a bit of silence now and then. And that's because I am sitting here editing and I'm getting mesmerized by the cuts that I'm doing and the wood just melting away. So a lot of time it's what's going through my head and while that's occurring it's almost nothing. At that point in time I had decided that while I would like and lip on the rim I decided against it. Purely because the bowl wasn't that big. Looking nasty. There's a catch. So I'm just going to square up the tail here. With the shark jaws, you don't need a or want, for lack of a better word. You don't really want the dovetail effect like you would do with the dovetail jaws. I prefer to have it square because then you've got all the teeth gripping in at the same time.
Now, what I've done here is I've actually grabbed some of the shavings. I have pushed it into this crack and I'm trying to put a bit of glue on it. And you'll notice here that nice piece of feather figure showing up. This is a bit of a first. This is a live session in the actual workshop. I only have a tiny little workshop. Now, as you can see, I've still got some cleanup to do on this, but before I took it any further, because I don't know if this piece is going to survive, I want to show off what I was originally aiming for. So as I turn around, you'll see that it's got the rings this way, it's got the rings this way, it's got the high rings here. That's, ex that's exactly what you expect of a bowl as you turn if it's just normal grain. Now, as we come around this corner, you'll start to see some other lines appearing in between and right here they're very pronounced and what that is is going to be full-blown chitoins if it survives now what's causing that is this so we've got a knot here and this knot was not visible from the outside that is a crack I suspect it's linked to that pith this was visible as well as all the stuff on the top but that not was definitely not so as you can see we've got it coming down wild through here and coming down wild through here and it has created what i suspect is going to be some absolutely gorgeous figure and that's only if it survives now as i said i did get a catch so i've still got to do a little bit of cleanup but the reason it might not survive is all of these cracks up here so we've got some cracks coming from the surface, we've got this big crack coming from that little pith there, and I really, really don't know if it's going to survive. Um, so I've got a square foot on this at the moment. When I turn this away later, I'm probably going to bring it down and finish arcing this and get almost a flat rim bottom. Um, and yeah, again, has to survive. Don't know if it will. Moving back into turning and going to clean up that glue after letting it set for a little while. So my main goal here is doing really, really light shaves and just getting rid of any of that glue that is above the surface. Because I've already happy with the shape overall. I'm just trying to get rid of that catch and as getting rid of any of the excess glue. Just another little quick touch up on that foot and I noticed I had a couple of pieces pull out and that one is a bit of fun the glue just kept sinking in and that one I did not let it dry long enough. As soon as the tool touched it, my face shield got covered in super glue. I've decided I'm going to remove the top down to that line once I actually turn it around. We're not far away from turning it around now. As you can tell, I'm stopping frequently just to double check and make sure I haven't gone too far, checking for any flat spots and trying to get it with a nice curvature. Turning the bowl around now and I can already see from this angle, something's not quite right. Tool rest was too low. And as you could hear me say, that's not true. Cause of this was some of the glue f went down and sat in the corner of the tenon. So what I did is I spent a little time with one of my carbide tools and I just stood there scraping it away. Now we turn it around and we are starting to hog out the center.
for me, this is some of the most satisfying cuts of the entire video. I really enjoy this uh, entire series. My main goal right now is getting it down to the line that I drew, which is below all of that black stuff. So I'm just quickly cutting down and hopefully I will get there. You can see there's maybe a quarter of a centimeter left back before that line. I just said to myself, yep, it's coming together nicely. Right now, I started to notice a black spot appear. You may see it spinning around there just before the pool. So right there, there's a nice black spot that's appeared. I wanted to see what that was. I thought it might have been a nail. And then I realized my tool rest was too close for that to pick up accurately. Everything looked good and off we go. Just doing these nice face cuts. And I've decided to start taking the center out and find the bottom of that woodworm hole. As you can tell, the cuts are starting to get a bit longer and longer. may notice quite a bit of rocking with the lathe, probably because I'm due another sharpen on the tool. And you'll notice that I use the multi-ring method here where I take it down and then I move back and I take it down and then I move back and I take it down and then I move back. So the reason I do this is A, trying to hog it out quickly and B, trying not to give myself a catch. This is what it looks like while I'm doing those steps from above. You may notice I'm wearing a Pokemon shirt. The reason I wear my Pokemon shirt while turning is, if you haven't noticed, I get a few catches. And the main theme for that is gotta catch them all. hear a little bit of vibration there of my tool on the tool rest as I was coming through. I wasn't applying enough downward pressure and yeah that's the result. The more downward pressure you use the more stable the tool tip and the better the result. Notice the tool rest was a little high. I couldn't quite get rid of the center. Now, speaking of catching them all, there's one. And that's the result of a solid catch. And having a good foot. Because if that was on that tiny little tenon, that was guaranteed to go rolling across the room and probably breaking into multiple pieces. Just 
ducked off for a quick sharpen there. As you can tell, some nice long curly bits flying off there. How I'm creating these rings is I'm putting the tip of the tool in and pushing with my back hand. And it's just letting the bevel cut in. It's almost at a perfect 12 o'clock, maybe a little bit back. Just enough to just engage and start cutting, but not enough to take a ton of wasted away. So the last thing I want to do is go flying through the bottom and create myself a colander. I switched my hand from holding with my fingers to resting with my palm, applying a lot of downward pressure. Now I'm using my guesstimate gauge here by rubbing my fingers up and down, seeing just how thick I am and if it's balanced. I've also decided that I'm going to take it off and try and address that knot from the inside. Sometimes it would be easier if I just took my face shield off, but it's so much effort putting it back on. And back into the cutting. I will stop frequently here and double check everything because last thing I want to do is have that not either completely fly out or cause any further damage. So I'm doing extremely light cuts, being extremely gentle with it and trying to give it some respect because I can really see that Chitoyans and figure in there now, and I am loving it. I really do want it to survive. Now I've taken it down far enough that it's taken the top off and now it's got a nice hole again. So it needs to be filled again. But for right now, I'm just going to continue turning because that wall thickness is about right and I'm actually quite happy with it. So you can see there how I was doing that rocking backwards and forwards. Doing it very gently, not trying to allow it to cut too much, but not allowing it to cut too little. Because when you get it to the center, it turns really slowly, so you really need to work it gently. So minimal pressure and just allow the tool to cut. quickly marked out a flat spot in the bottom of the bowl and trying to get rid of that and curve the bottom up to it. problem with what I'm doing there is as the bowl turns and I am turning quite fast so as the bowl turns it's actually flexing out so it's never going to be good to touch up the top of the bowl and I don't normally do that but in this case I did I'm trying to use this finishing tool and 
get rid of any of those flat spots. Oh yeah, quick touch up with the round nose scraper. And it's not scraping very well, and so I decide to switch over to my small bowl gouge. I just quickly took the edge off the outside rim of the bowl because if it caught my finger it would have been sharp and I really don't want any damage so I'll just give it a little round and hopefully that'll avoid any damage moving into sanding and I've decided to power sand this all the way up to 400 grit I start with the coarse grit and I go into deciding it's not good enough. So I will jump across to 40 grit sandpaper. I will try and get rid of some of those tool marks as well as some of the excess glue. jump straight up to the next grit and get back to sanding now at this point I realized that there's still quite a bit of hole left in that knot so I decide to apply some more glue and as you can see that chatoyance is really starting to come out Turns out micro mesh works as a nice base to raise and have it sit on an angle. Not entirely sure what caused that because I didn't have a catch. I may have happened while I was sanding. I'm not entirely sure. Either way, it's now an accent piece because it's cased in glue. Okay, and remount, and let's get back to sanding. As you can hear, all of that 40 grit going over the sandpaper. And then I nick my finger on that outside edge. You'll notice coming up here shortly, I am now wearing a band-aid. I have sanded down with 40 grit, happy with that. Now let's try and get a bit of a finish on it. So after I caught my finger, I then decide to show the camera. Now I'm just quickly gonna buzz through these. You'll notice there I've got the beeswax and I've got a bit of chopping board oil. Satisfied with how this sanding has come up, I will now move over to applying some finish. What I did was I applied some oil, I let it sit, I then took excess oil off by turning the lathe on, I then let it sit a bit longer and soak in a bit more and I did that process three times and then I applied some beeswax. I don't think I show the entire process, just jump straight to the beeswax after this one.
not quite as satisfying as some of the other finishes I've put on because claret ash is claret ash. The oil had already brought out most of the color. And as you can see, that figure goes the whole way across the bottom of that bowl and up through that knot. Come here, boy. Where's that bowl? Stole the dog's toy and stuck it in the bowl. I'm kidding. The dog still has his bowl. Spend probably eight minutes here trying to balance this and get it as close to possible. And now I'm going to take that tenon down. I'm actually not going to get rid of the tenon entirely. I am going to keep some of it, but I'm going to shape it into the bowl. Right here I've noticed that I'm going to have to go extremely light because it's already starting to lose its shape. So I stopped it, I rebalanced it, and now I'm trying to blend it back together. So I'm doing a quick touch, I stop it, I rebalance it, I do a touch, I stop it, I rebalance it, and that process continues probably for 20 minutes, because this is very light and gentle touches. I just have it sped up a very long way. I'm being very gingerly because as I mentioned earlier, I do not want this to explode because it is beautiful. Still a couple of little pieces up the top there that have the glue, as you can tell. Other discoloration and again, just balancing it gently. Focusing on that top rim. Almost there. Now what I've pulled out here is actually a detail spindle gouge because I want to be able to remove that nub and I'm trying to form a nice little cove on the bottom. Satisfied with that, I am going to try and stand that little catch out from up a little bit and I will sand the entire thing. The catch is still there, so I continue buzzing through quickly. And at this point, the catch is still there. So I decide to cut my losses and just accept that it's now a character flaw. Applying the first coat of finish, and I did the same process for this finish. I just didn't do it for the actual under foot. So in the bottom of there, I only put some oil on, and it was just a light touch up just to blend some of the color together. Now 
Now I've pulled that detail spindle gouge back out and I'm taking that nub down to almost nothing. And I am just pressing in gently on the bevel edge and pop goes the weasel. Pull out the power sanding and take away that nub and I am very pleased with the finished results. As I said earlier in the video, there is some amazing Australian turners out there and woodworkers in general. Check out Sid's and Alan's channels and if you're enjoying my content, please like and subscribe. I do appreciate it. Jump into the comments because I do try and interact with everyone and here's some photos of the finished bowl. As you can see, that glue is allowing the light to pour through. It's actually added quite a nice accent to it, and I love this bowl.